Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to the third and last lecture on global culture here at the University of uh, the Arts in Zurich. Uh, I'm, I mean, for autumn. We're going to continue next year, certainly. Um, I'm Michael Schinterm, the initiator of this series, and I'm particularly happy to welcome among us today Dr. Vishaka uh, Desai, uh, coming all the way down from New York uh, to us specifically for this event. Thank you very much for being here tonight and giving us a lecture. Um, Dr. Desai is, I would say, something like a professional all-rounder. She was uh, born in Bombay and studied um, social, uh, uh, political sciences before she moved to the United States. She holds a PhD in art history and is an expert in contemporary but also traditional uh, Indian art. Um, she um, was an art administrator at some point uh, several years ago, I would say. Um, but for a long time, she worked uh, with the uh, Asia Society, which is a non for profit organization in the United States um, committed to strengthening the relationship between organizations and people in Asia and the United States. She was working there for more than 20 years, and for a long time she was the president of this organization, until very recently, in fact. And as she told me, she's still on the board, and she holds also a very particular title now. She is the president emerita of this uh, organization until now. Uh, but she um, sort of changed the scene uh, a year ago, and is today special advisor um, to the president and a professor of practice at the uh, Columbia University. And she's also a um, senior advisor to the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation for global programming and for global policy. Uh, Dr. Desai is um, an art historian and a curator, and in this position she has uh, published a lot of works and um, is, as a, I would say, policymaker, um, known for her uh, very important contributions on how Asia uh, and the Western world interact um, in our current situation. And I think this is what we will talk about today. Uh, after having dealt during the last months here in our series with subjects such as the um, tool of real-time tracking for understanding the contemporary urban condition in cities today uh, through a lecture given by Carlo Ratti in, in September, and uh, sorry, in October, and uh, with uh, uh, the dreams and limitations of the uh, enhancement of the human capabilities by modern technology presented in a film. We saw four weeks ago uh, a film by a, a Dutch filmmaker named Brechtje van der Haag. We today probably focus on global cultural policy. This is your very subject, uh, dear Vishaka, and I would like you to come, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for that more than generous introduction, and good evening. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also very happy to tell you that the temperature in Zurich is about the same as in New York, so I don't have to complain about the weather. Um, I am delighted to be here for a number of reasons, because when I met Michael almost, it feels, a year and a half ago, was in Salzburg, and we were talking about the notion of changing world dynamics and how do we understand it? And it was at that point when I was doing yet another talk that Michael said, you must really come to the University of the Arts in Zurich. And so I'm delighted to be able to speak with you on what I have entitled Soft Power of Rising Powers, China and India. Let me just tell you why I think it's important that we talk about 
the role of China and India, especially China, in the 21st century. I don't have to tell you that, in fact, China is ubiquitous in the news today, whether it's about security issues on the uh, uh, Chinese seas along with Japan, or it's about the new trends in 2014 that you might read in The Economist. I think the two points that we need to really get firmly in our mind is that by the year, it used to be that people said by the year 2050. Now, in fact, most scholars would agree that by the year 2035, in fact, 50% or more than 50% of world's GDP will come from China and India alone. Similarly, already by the year 2035 or earlier, 60% of world's population will come from these two countries alone. So you're talking about a shift that is momentous, that is unbelievable for all of us who are used to the Euro-American axis in terms of the world power for the last 250 years. So it's not simply the stories of China where the purchase of familiar Western brands such as the Geely purchase of Volvo or Tata's purchase of Jaguar. You are talking about not just the purchases and economic terms, but it also is about the military power of these two countries after the United States. So I want to kind of think about this issue of how China sees itself today. So that when all of us who are used to going to China all the time, many of our friends would say, you know, this is really China's sense of its right plus play, rightful place after more than two centuries of humiliation. What do they mean by that? Essentially it is that in fact this idea of world's GDP coming from China and India, 50% of world's GDP, was exactly where it was circa 1800. So as far as the Chinese are concerned, in their 5,000 year or more of long history, those last 250 years or so are kind of a blip, and now they have their rightful place. That idea encounters inevitability of where China should be from being humiliated for the last century to come back center stage. In India, you don't have that very formed idea of its place in the world, but there is some kind of a sense of inevitability that India, too, will be center stage as is it's on its rise, even though today both countries have some economic downturns. India is no longer at 8%, but it's more like at a 4.5%, 4.8%. The point is that economically the trajectory is seen as coming on this idea of becoming center stage. Often when we think about center stage, it's primarily in economic terms. And as Joe Nye has talked about, that idea of hard power is usually seen in economic and military terms. So it behooves us to understand that when we talk about hard power, we're really talking about countries' ability to make others act as you want or an ability to exert influence by force if necessary. This is how Professor Nye has defined hard power. Today, when we talk about the issues of Senkaku Islands, or as the Chinese would say, the contested islands, and what China has done right now, it is about exerting influence by force if necessary. But there is another kind of power that countries can also exert, and that is indeed the soft power. Usually, when we think about America as a superpower, we think about it in terms of hard power, economic and military power, as well as the soft power in terms of how the country is perceived. And now, this term, which was coined by Professor Joe Nye in 1990, that's become a pretty common, almost an overused term, where he has defined it as a nation's ability to attract and persuade rather than forcing others by 
necessity if, uh, as, you, as you think about hard power. But it is the nation's ability to attract and persuade getting others to want the outcome you want, stemming from the attractiveness of the country's culture, ideals, and perhaps the international communication policies. So the purpose of this conversation with you is really to think about the use of culture in projecting the national image abroad by enhancing it, establishing the bona fides of the country as a great superpower. And I want to think about both China and India in terms of the governmental policy, which is really mainly what soft power should be or is thought about, is that power is about projection. And so it's what is the governmental policy, but also the, what is the role of the non-governmental actors in terms of the reception of the country abroad, and focus both on the intent of the country, the government, and the reception of how it's perceived outside. So you're projecting it out, how it's perceived outside, and the underlying reasons that might actually explain if there are discrepancies between the intent and the reception. And I want to kind of think about this in the context of the fact that both countries have understood that both Europe and America actually have had a very fine strategy in many countries of perfection of this kind of a uh, soft power especially during the Cold War, uh, most people would think about the issues of how America used jazz, performing arts, films, and visual arts to project out. I myself remember as a young child in India, as a dancer, to actually witness Martha Graham and, and seeing those performances, and what it said about America in the world when you thought that this America stood for freedom, freedom of expression, amazing art forms that you actually might not think about Soviet Union in the same way. So this idea is something that countries like China and India have thought about. In China, I would say that it is really particularly a 21st century phenomenon. So I want to talk first about China, then we'll talk about India, and then we'll talk about the reception of the uh, soft power policies on the world stage. In China, uh, we should really kind of think about the fact that rather than having culture as part of the foreign policy or some relationship thereof, Ministry of Culture, which sometimes was also called the Ministry of Propaganda, is what is responsible for projecting China's image culturally abroad. When it first began, as early as in 1949, it really was to understand the communist ideology in cultural terms, and the very first uh, director of the cultural ministry, Shen Yanbing, was actually a very fine writer, but he was also a secretary to Mao Zedong. And he was responsible for thinking about literature in communist terms. So the socialist agenda was a very important part, or communist agenda was a very important part of what the Ministry of Culture would do. It's also important to remember that he held that position from 1949 to 1965. And then he was purged, along with any other intellectuals who were seen as obviously not being right for cultural revolution. And then, in fact, the ministry closed down a year later. And it was not until 1980s that the ministry opens up again. And it is not until the 21st century that the Chinese begin to really think about, in the first decade, about how to use culture as a way to project its image abroad. One of the first things that you begin to see then is through the Confucius Institutes. And Confucius Institutes that now are a very, very important part of the Ministry of Education. And you would see that, in fact, by the end of 2010, and there is now going even forward with this, that there have been 322 Confucius Institutes, 369 Confucius classrooms established in 96 countries, and now it has already gone to 100 countries. 
and there are some 20, 150, uh, 250 institutions from over 50 countries that have actually uh, worked with this idea of a Confucius Institute. The very idea of Confucius Institute is worthwhile for us to look at. Uh, I'm sure, I'm not sure how many there are in Zurich, but I know in Switzerland there are Confucius Institutes. What's interesting about the name Confucius Institutes is that the Chinese government looked very carefully at what to call it. The idea was something like Japan Foundation, or maybe it would be something else, and they decided that Confucius as a word was a better word to project out because it had the least amount of controversy associated with it outside, abroad, as a sage of learning. That therefore it was better to call these institutes Confucius Institutes than institutes of Chinese learning or China Institutes or things of that sort. And in fact, it has created some controversies and we will come back to this idea of what the controversies are about um, when we come back to the reception of it. But the other part that also began to uh, be part of the leader's consciousness was that you cannot be a great power without thinking about China's cultural place in the world. And the former president, Hu Jintao, actually worked on this. And some of you who follow China will know that, in fact, he created a very new emphasis on, uh, on this idea of what China should be if it desires to be a global player. And in one of his most important speeches, and he began to talk about this in 2009, but then in 2011, um, to the Central Committee's decision on culture, he actually gave the first major speech on this. And let me just quote from that so that you understand where uh, this idea comes from. That, and this is a translation of Hu Jintao's speech. At present, the world is in a period of great development, great change, and great readjustment. At present, when China is on the course of turning toward a new struggle objectives to forge ahead, in a new historical starting point, which is about China's global position, the function of culture is even more broad and deep. From the international point of view, one clear characteristic of comprehensive national strength and competition is that the position and function of culture has become even more prominent. Many countries, especially major large countries in the West, all have taken raising cultural soft power as an important strategy for strengthening national core competitiveness. With the background that within the global scope, all sorts of ideological and cultural exchange, blending and battle have become even more frequent. Who occupies the commanding heights of cultural development possesses strong cultural soft power and is able to gain the, and that is a country that is able to gain the leadership in the fierce national competition. And then he goes on to say, but we must soberly be aware that hostile foreign powers are intensifying strategies and plots to westernize and divide our country. The ideological and cultural sphere is the focus sphere in which they conduct long-term infiltration. We must deeply recognize the gravity and complexity of struggle in the ideological domain. Ring the alarm bell and be on the long-term guard. Adopt forceful measures to be on guard and react. What this really means is that Hu Jintao, for the first time at the very top level, the Chinese party, Communist Party, is saying, if we don't claim superiority in the cultural realm, we actually are going to fall behind. So we cannot claim to have a global superpower status without understanding the role of culture. And out of that emerges the policies of building major new museums in China. Many of you know that the idea was minimum of 100 new museums in a decade alone. 
So the whole enterprise of museum, performing arts, building theaters, building operas, all of that is about projecting China abroad. Similarly, so there is not only about what people see when they come to China, but it's also about how Chinese culture can be projected abroad. And this idea of projection abroad also has to do with a number of Chinese festivals, performing arts festival, all supported by the government. Where is the problem? The problem is what can they do about what kind of culture? And can they actually also embrace the non-governmental actors who are artists in private realm? How do we deal with this? And that's where the question of culture in the domestic realm becomes a problem for China. And I want to come back to this when we talk about the reception and how people perceive Chinese culture when it is promoted by the government as we come back. On the Indian side, you have a, a very different situation. In India, the Indian Council on Cultural Relations was founded more on the model of British Council. And obviously being colonized by Britain, you can see that this is a model that will be developed. But what is interesting about that is that it's a semi-autonomous or almost autonomous body with some relationship to the foreign ministry or the Ministry of External Affairs and some relationship to the Ministry of Culture, but it is not part of the Ministry of Culture. Here, it was founded in 1949, and it was founded by one of the leading Muslim leaders of the independence movement, Maulana Azad. And I want to read to you, at the time of the founding of ICCR, what Maulana Azad had to say. And the reason for that is that you will see that the tone is a very, very different kind of a tone from what we have seen in China. And it, it goes back to Maulana Azad actually talking about um, how he is proud of being both a Muslim and an Indian. And in this case, he talks about how uh, he is proud of taking on the Muslim traditions and he's equally proud of the role of Muslim culture that makes India what it is. So the notion of diversity, the notion of diversity of thought, the notion of a democratic nation, these three Ds as I call them, diversity, democracy, and the kind of deep connection to the past and the heritage as a sense of pride is what makes Indian Council on Cultural Relations and the communion of ideas as it is really positioned itself becomes the fundamental iconic narrative of the Indian tradition. And in this case, what the Indian Council on Cultural Relations, which is the governmental arm of the external relations of culture, makes it possible is it's more through festivals all over the world. It's also more through endowment of chairs at universities in the last 20 some years. Uh, rather than thinking of projection of culture as a kind of a might, the way you see in China today. And that idea of the might of culture and how to incorporate that into the muscular strategy of the government is a much more important part of China even today. So that in the recent articulation of Xi Jinping, for example, he's called this the Zheng Wuomeng, or Chinese dream. So how does he look at culture? He's changed it slightly from where Hu Jintao was. He talks about strong China, that is economical and military power of China, a civilized China, which is about culture and the morals, harmonious China, meaning more, less inequality and more consensus model, but some people also, of course, would talk about harmonious China as less dissident China, beautiful China, meaning better environment, less pollution, 
And these things that then become part of what Hillary Clinton used to talk about it as kind of smart power, combining soft and the hard power. So there is an attempt to create a cohesive strategy in which culture plays an important part. In India, I dare say that oftentimes what happens is that culture goes off on its own part and it doesn't completely get connected back to the foreign policy objectives or the hard power strategy of the government. In fact, some scholars in India and abroad have talked about this idea as a lack of strategy, that there is no strategy to bring these things together, and that therefore you might have a wonderful festival as in fact just happened in Belgium that some of you may have gone to, um, which is this sort of the Europhilia, 450 events, there were many different things going on, similar kind of festival that happened on Focus on China in 2009, but if you really analyze the 2009 Festival of China, same organization, and 2013 Festival of India, what becomes very clear to me, I participated in neither. I looked at both of those and analyzed them. It was very interesting to me that the Chinese made a very big point of what was the organizing committee. And the committee that involved almost all sanctioned leaders of culture who were involved. And the topics that they used, and let me actually uh, uh, give them, just, just give you some sense of these titles that is more like immortal China. The contemporary accomplishments, cultural China, and the beautiful China. Whereas the Indian piece is all over the map. It has no guiding principles. So there is beyond Bollywood, there is cities, there is contemporary art, there is traditional art, there is Ramayana. And you say, don't you have a kind of a philosophy around this? And in fact, some of my Indian friends who were involved would say, no, that's the point. It is about many different things that we call India today. And this actually, one might say, is a blessing in disguise. So while the policymakers feel that India lacks a strategic culture, <clears throat> perhaps there is, in fact, this idea that as a result, India is perceived more positively in soft power terms. Because people trust that India is not pushing something down people's throat that India actually will allow yoga, alternative medicine, Bollywood, all to be part of how India is perceived in cultural terms. But there is, I think, another big factor, and this comes back to some recent polls of how China is perceived in the world. It turns out that Confucius Institutes notwithstanding Many people want to study Chinese. There is no problem about that. That, in fact, China, even in Southeast Asia, is not perceived as positively as even Japan. So what is that about? Why is that so? Some might say that it's mainly because it's a new rising power and China's place as a global player is much more assured than is India. Another uh, poll that suggests, that I think also suggests an interesting discrepancy is that is that Indians think that after China and the United States, they are the third most important player. Nowhere else in the world does anybody think India is that important. India comes down as eighth, ninth, somewhere in there. But India's perception of itself, the Indians' perception of themselves, is that they are very important. And perhaps because they're not really seen as that important, people are not worried about it. That's one possibility. The other more, I think, deeply um, important criteria is that, in fact, China has such a problematic relationship with its own culture that people don't trust how cultural strategy is perceived outside. 
And this is something that Professor Nye also talks about, and that is that by and large, and this may be a Western bias, but I think there is something about that, is that if internal factors of democracy, open government, open press, are not perceived the same way internally, externally, there's also a question. So let me give you an example. This whole business of Confucius Institute, I think is a very interesting uh, example to understand about China's predicament, which is that here they use the word Confucius Institute for the outside because in the outside world, Confucius is one word that is not controversial. When they place a sculpture of Confucius in Tiananmen Square in front of the big National Museum of History, there was such an outcry within China that the sculpture had to be removed within 24 hours. Why was there an outcry? Because there were people who talked about the fact that here was a man who internally, during Cultural Revolution, was completely derided. Internally, where the ancient culture of China was completely discarded. So for four generations of Chinese, there is a deeply skeptical attitude towards their own history and towards Confucius. How do you then reconcile the image abroad and image within? And when that controversy or, con or conflict about culture and the power of culture in, in more as a dissident attitude, is also seen as a question mark, it becomes very problematic for the government to project that abroad as culture, as some kind of a continuous, long-term civilizational force. And everybody else feels that. So the dissonance that you feel about projection of a governmental cultural power compared to where culture is within China, creates also a problem for how China uses soft power. On India, on the other hand, you almost have this taken for granted quality about culture. <clears throat> the percentage of money given to ICCR or any other cultural endeavors abroad is paltry compared to what happens in China. The study of culture within India in a serious way where humanities, studies of culture are almost negligent. And what I mean by that is that almost all the powerful students, smartest students all go into Indian Institute of Technology, Indian Institute of Management, which is all about technology, math, and science as the preeminent force for the smartest kids. In the last five-year plan of Indian government, when you look at the role of education, I must say what is shocking to me is that in the 18 some pages about talking about what the education priorities are, the word culture is mentioned exactly once, and that too in a very minimal way. So that means that the study of culture it's assumed that it will somehow happen by osmosis, that the government doesn't need to really put the kind of energy that it needs to, to support this notion of continuity of culture. So you have a slightly different set of problems as far as India is concerned. But India's projection of non-governmental sector, free press, as well as the kind of establishment of uh, Bollywood even, really creates this sense that India is a flourishing cultural place and therefore, in fact, the government is not as important a player. My contention is that at the same time, India actually doesn't take advantage of that very powerful position that India is so focused on what I call being GDP junkie that Almost all the power goes towards the economic powers of India, which even if India achieves it at best, 
will be a pale reflection of the West, I contend, that India's special position is in its cultural uniqueness, which India itself doesn't, government itself doesn't really pay attention to. So you have a rather interesting situation whereby in China, government is looking at a muscular way of projecting and using culture to project its image abroad, but there is a problem about how it gets perceived. India has all the goodwill of a variety of cultural factors that exist outside, but the government doesn't use it in an active way to actually position India in a superior position as far as cultural is concerned. The role of contemporary artist in both places is another piece that we might want to also think about, which is that when we think about China and we think about contemporary art, the power of many Chinese contemporary artists, whether it's Sai Guo Chang or it's uh, Xu Bing or Ai Weiwei, who has become so famous, um, really creates this position but most people perceive the power of many of these Chinese artists in opposition to the governmental force. In India, on the other hand, there are many artists who are out there, none as powerful as some of the major Chinese contemporary artists, but Subodh Gupta, who is seen outside. There are now a number of other artists who are also seen in many, many international arenas. Even if they criticize the government, people expect them. It's no big deal. And at the same time, they don't really have the same kind of oppositional element to the government because, in fact, the government is not a, such an important part of what they do. So you have a situation whereby the private sector contemporary art scene again, can actually support the image and the narrative of India as a kind of an open society, therefore more trustworthy compared to the Chinese society where people constantly are thinking about the distinction between the Chinese people and the Chinese leaders. The question is, how far would this continue to go? And I think that there are three things that I would like to briefly observe and then we'll open it up to discussion with all of you. And that is that all of these are very nascent efforts. 20 years is a very short period of time. The perception of India and China, or China and India rather, as becoming global players is just beginning to get into our consciousness. And therefore, most of that perception of China and India as rising players is in economic terms. And yet, in economic terms, we know that it's more the size of the economy rather than per capita income that Indians or Chinese can actually become as well off as all of us in the West. So that's number one. Number two, the economic power and the cultural role probably go hand in hand, but cultural sector will follow the economic perception. For China, they understand completely that for it to be seen as a superpower, it must have a cultural strategy as part of its economic and military might. India, takes it for granted that they are a long-living civilization and somehow people will only understand it because they are who they are. And there is a tendency in India to also feel that if the world doesn't get it, it's their problem. And somehow they're gonna have to understand it. Those of us in the diaspora feel that that's rather not helpful, that you need to actually create a strategy. And I actually have gone on the record in a recent publication to say that, in fact, it is in the cultural arena that India has an opportunity to shine in a unique way as a superpower and to change the paradigm so that the paradigm is not just about determination through the hard power, but the paradigm is to say that culture matters even more, where you have a unique role 
And the argument I make is that in 1947, when world looked to India at the time of independence, it was not because India was rich. It's because India had a moral core with Gandhian principle and Gandhi who understood that it was both cultural and historical and philosophical ideas that came together to create something special called independent India. And it is that kind of a moral core that comes from the cultural side, and in this case I mean cultural with a small c, not just culture as in high culture of production of the arts, but arts in addition to other arenas that actually there is an opportunity, and that is the opportunity that India needs to take in the 21st century. What can China do? I think for China, increasingly, I mean, and, and Michael and I have talked about this, so that there is obviously a much more opening at the grassroots level than ever before, but there is also a self-censorship. The sooner you understand that you cannot have a dissonant relationship to culture internally while projecting it externally, the better Chinese will also be seen as a kind of powerful culture that is not always in opposition to the political power. How we talk about this 25 years from now, only all of us have to watch and see. And that is what is exciting about looking at where these two countries are today globally, especially in a cultural sense. And I, for one, am excited about at least being an observer and a participant in this new changing world order in which non-Western civilizational forces like China and India become center stage along with the Western powers that we all are used to for the last 250 years. Thank you very much. Inspiring um, speech. Thank you very much, Vishaka. I think uh, there's lots to uh, say, to share, to uh, to comment, to maybe debate. Um, let me start uh, with one question. I'm not a semitician, but um, I'm coming uh, from East Germany and grew up uh, in a country with also a sort of a soft power. The word didn't exist at that time yet, and I sometimes wonder. Uh, how much soft power is not just a replacement by a word we are very much used to, which is ideology. Um, and I think what, what I learned from, what I pick up from, from, your, from, from your speech today in particular is the difference in um, approaching uh, cultural achievements and cultural potentials in China and in India. And uh, I think one of the major reasons why China is thinking so much about soft power is it's an authoritarian country. And as an authoritarian country, it needs to create a narrative about itself, which is not necessarily the narrative of the culture of the country or of the population of the country. And therefore, it is a kind of surrogate of, of the ideology of, of, of the system itself. And um, I also wonder often when I'm traveling uh, in China, uh, what it will look like in 10, 20, 30 years ago, and I'm more and more actually keen to see how the younger generation today relates to this. They have, again, a very different approach to the people, the kinds of Ai Weiwei, for example, who are representing rather my generation, who somehow as, as uh, students experience the Cultural Revolution yet. But what, uh, what you can see is that China has somehow really almost completely disconnected over the last hundred years from its own culture. It was not only these eight years of cultural revolution, but it started actually in 1911 or at least uh, 1917. Yeah? So it's a whole century with uh, one disaster after the other, and therefore almost a complete wipe out of uh, cultural traditions. As you say, I mean, even in the late 70s, Confucius was sort of banned yet in the country. 
uh, although at the same time, paradoxically, the first institute, uh, Confucius Institute, was probably founded in eight, 1984 or so already. So that is also interesting, these kind of paradoxes. Um, I'm, I'm s saying this because we are sitting here in Zurich, uh, in Switzerland, a country which is not very known for its soft power, uh, but extremely visible, for example, in China uh, through its industries, like, for example, watches. So it's a kind of soft power, and I take this very seriously, what I'm saying. I would say that um, there are countries uh, being very small and having almost natural ability to disseminate certain values, uh, a certain national culture. Uh, and I think this is something what interests us here in Europe uh, a lot, because uh, we probably do not speak so uh, often anymore about power. We don't like this word so much, as you know. But we may actually share similar interests with the, the Asian uh, 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 policymakers in India or in China. Yeah, I, I, you have uh, the first one. Uh, it's done, yes. Uh, you've really touched on many of the topics that interest me a great deal. Um, first of all, let's just use the word soft power. I was uh, in Shanghai about three years ago when we were looking at India, China, and the US relationship. And a colleague of mine said, I resist the word soft power because power is still about the government. That we should really think about and distinguish from use of culture as instrument of foreign policy versus culture as in interconnections of people. And that therefore, we should get away from the notion of power because it's always about ideology, whichever way it is. Um, and I think that's sort of an interesting position. At the same time, it's also true that many smaller countries, especially in Europe, they have really used the idea of culture as in small c, not culture just as in arts, but culture as in whether it's watchmaking or anything else. And how do you project a sense of the country um, that's different. You know, just to give you an example, Thailand really figured out that people like Thai food, and you all think that it just sort of happened by osmosis, that there are lots of Thai restaurants. Believe it or not, the government figured out that this was a good way to project Thailand, and they created special export promotion for Thai food, and it was all over, and before you know it, Thai food has become like Chinese food, you know, it's everywhere. And that idea was to use food as a way of projecting the soft power of a culture. So what are the ways that the government can actually enhance and support some of these ideas would be one way to think about soft power, not so much as an ideology. I think for what I was trying to get at in China is precisely that on the one hand, they understand that culture is a very important part of an overall strategy of how the country is perceived. And yet there is such a conflicting relationship to its past that until they resolve that, it's very hard for the world to respect it or to trust it, especially if it comes from the government. Just to give you a, one another personal example, in 19... 96, we were beginning to do a major exhibition at the Asia Society of Contemporary Chinese Art. Asia Society is as much about culture as it's about foreign policy, it's about education, and I was very aware that we had done lots of business conferences on China, and how do we actually tell the government that we were going to do this big contemporary Chinese exhibition? And we finally figured out that, and the exhibition was going to have art from Taiwan, from Hong Kong, as well as from mainland. And um, we finally decided that the best thing for us was not to ask for the permission of the government, but to let them know we were doing it. And I can now tell you that, in fact, in this meeting, we were talking about a number of different Chinese things we were doing at the Asia Society, and I just let it slip that we were planning to do this exhibition. and. The ambassador looked at me and he said, I don't need to know. Meaning, at that point, they had figured out that it, 
if I had asked for the permission, they wouldn't give me the permission. They couldn't. On the other hand, the best thing was he didn't know it was happening. They also understood at that point that this was perhaps one of the ways that Chinese could be seen differently. That was in the late 90s. Today, there are certain, I mean, the same thing with 798, the big Chinese district. There would be some support for it because they had figured out that this would be actually useful in terms of projection of China abroad. But only as far as how people would talk about the society. And I think the self-censorship in China is still pretty high. So that what people can talk about, what they can't talk about, what they can say, what they can't say. And the predominant feeling in China today when you talk to younger people is that of cynicism, I believe. So on the one hand, there is a notion that we can do anything we want, but we know what the limits are. And yet, on the online social media, there are wonderful, amazing ways that people will actually come at certain level of criticism that is much more creative than in India. And that, I think, is something to watch for, that that creativity about dissonance, um, about dissident quality, not that everybody's going to feel it, is something to, to really watch out for because I believe in China there's a history of dissident voices that is much, much greater than it has been in India. So as early as in Yuan Dynasty, for example, in the 13th century, you can have an artist who refuses to serve the Mongol emperor and can create an ink painting that is actually is a veiled attempt to be a dissident artist. 13th century, it's pretty amazing. That kind of thing you won't see in India. And that's something I think also is worth looking at culturally as to what, how people express themselves. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can imagine that there is indeed um, uh, almost something like a uh, inscripted uh, culture of um, um, of the underground, uh, of the uh, uh, palimpsest, of uh, of the metaphor, and I think this is something which um, has a long tradition in China and has actually no tra whatsoever tradition probably in countries like India. Um, but on the other hand, um, globalization has has brought also uh, plenty of opportunities to communicate in a society without. Um, being uh, exposed as an individual. Uh, I think the most important impact also on the Chinese society today is of course the internet and uh, what internet is able uh, to convey in terms of uh, criticism or uh, critical voices. Um, but again, in China it is, it is a, a kind of a designed um, a platform or a designed landscape um, with uh, various uh, uncertainties about what is actually possible with modern, where censorship starts and where what is actually allowed. I wonder, um, for example, if it is really possible to say how uh, Chinese society, how, how Chinese people today feel. Because on one hand, you feel, of course, that there's a certain frustration or dissatisfaction uh, among broader layers in the society about things like pollution or uh, other uh, also social issues in the country. On the other hand, it is hard to say, in fact, because nobody really knows. This is something uh, which is very different from democratic countries, where a kind of self-reflection uh, in the society going on through media, which allow uh, to talk to each other and to communicate. So to some extent, you never actually know what is China about, what is the status of, of China, in particular also to its own we speak very often about the confidence of the people. I'm not even sure if that is true, because you cannot really prove this. Or what do you think? Yeah, I, you know, it's an interesting situation with social media. One of the things, I was literally three weeks ago, I was at a conference with a number of young Chinese intellectuals, um, young, you know, late 30s, early 40s. Um, exactly. So, uh, and one of them, 
is actually focused on creating technology tools that can be ahead of the government censors to how to break what they create so that in fact more people can be free to uh, say things in Weibo and other social media tools. And he was talking about how there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese employed by the government just to keep an eye out on what's happening on the social media. And the words, for example, Tiananmen Square, if that word comes in, how to quickly remove it, when do you allow for certain things to stay on, and then take it off. Sites that go up, sites that go down. So clearly, on the one hand, social media allows you to have connection, and on the other hand, also the government is trying very hard to stay out of the curve. Um, I think that what people don't talk about in India is actually the social media is more curtailed than you would expect. For a country that has such porous free media, and what happens is in the name of inciting communalism or social unrest. So today, there are people beginning to now talk about controls of social media in India. That's not political, but it's in the name of harmony. In fact, the government has often put sides down. The only good thing is that there are enough people in the press who are also gonna complain about that. So I think the role of globalization, communication, travel, I think the awareness of many, many Chinese of what's happening in the world is absolutely staggering, as it's true, by the way, in Iran. Any one of you who have been to Iran, it's amazing to me how the younger Iranians know what's going on. And there the controls are even worse than they are in China. So there is something about interconnectivity of the world. And then within that, how do you create a sense of national culture, especially for young people? And how important is it? You know, yeah, that's a question uh, probably many uh, yeah. people would not ask anymore in, German, in, in, in Europe today because we sort of on one hand think uh, we have a national culture, but on the other hand, we don't think that it is so necessary, so important right. any, any further. And um, I mean, soft power is certainly a, a diplomatic uh, term or a term of uh, diplomacy. If we uh, look at our uh, cultural diplomacy in Europe, then we see first and foremost that these national uh, representations for culture being founded some decades ago, mostly after the Second World War, like Alliance Francaise or mm -hmm. British Council, they all struggle. Yeah. They all struggle, good institute. They all struggle to some extent because the, uh, they were used to represent a country abroad, uh, and you can say also to convey a certain national soft power. Uh, today, uh, many of these organizations have actually shrink, shrunk uh, to um, becoming sometimes an organizer of certain cultural events, but otherwise being a school for language, right? So they, they're rather uh, s sort of uh, supporting development of, of uh, or dissemination of the language, but otherwise they are not as important anymore as they were used to be. Why? Because uh, today, uh, an artist or th they were used to do a lot of exchange between countries and cultural institutions and cultural individuals. Today, there's no need for, uh, for, uh, for an artist or for a cultural institution in, in a European country to go through a national institution and to uh, arrange contacts in other countries. They do this directly. So they don't need this kind of uh, go between any further. On the other hand, in China, for example, you need th to talk to the government first <laughs> and foremost. So there's a kind of incompatibility uh, between how culture is yeah. developed in our countries. How do you see this? Because I think here the role of institutions uh, plays a certain role uh, to somehow go between the government and the individual. See, I, I would look at it slightly differently. I agree with you that the Goethe Institutes and the British Councils and the Alliance Frances, uh, all of these organizations are playing not as important a role as they may have before. Same reason why United States completely have done away with USIA and it's now become a small part of the public diplomacy of the State Department. I think that in the name of institution to institution contact, 
when the governments completely get out of it. And it is not necessarily replaced by any other private support always. So the result is that in fact culture diminishes in importance in international communication um, in the sense of where does the support come from. I speak as an American now rather than an Indian whereby in America big international, big, big institutions are still having a hard time finding support for global work, for international work. And I personally think that we all have to fight for getting every single dollar or euro or Swiss francs that we can get to really create that work because otherwise the discussion is entirely, globalization becomes entirely about economy and material ways of being rather than a cultural way of being. Now in China and India, especially China, you're right, part of the problem is that the institutions are weak. So if you want to do some work, especially in China, you can't actually just go and make that pattern on your own because every single institution you still have to go, to go through the government process. Similarly in India, for example, if you want to do an exhibition of traditional art, even from a private museum, you cannot do that without getting the government permission, which is not the case if you're gonna do something in Europe or in the United States. Um, contemporary art, if I want to borrow things from India for contemporary art, I still got to get the Reserve Bank permission because the currency is limited and there is a worry that these things are going to be sold and then the money will be made and it doesn't come back. So the nation, con national controls still remain very powerful in both of these countries in different ways. And essentially you can say that that's old fashioned way of being and I think to some extent it is true, but I think that what we're looking at in the 21st century as I see it, is that you really have to look at all layers. You have to look at national, you have to look at transnational. Transnational may come from the economic side of things. Nationhood, nation states are not going away anytime soon. So you have to look at the layering of each one of these as well as individual connections. And how can states actually support some of this transnational cultural work is still important. And we still have to fight for it. So my feeling is we have to give primacy to cultural interaction in the days of economic glo globalization. And where can we find that support depends on institutions as well as nation states. Yeah, I mean, I would like to uh, also involve the uh, audience. Uh, maybe you have questions. There's somebody. Do we have a microphone? Yes, yes, this one. Thank you. What do you think? Let's assume that a country who is not as powerful, as known in the rest of the world, as um, rich in cultural manifestations as China or India. Let's assume Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Plans to project the broad, a certain image of its beauty, richness, idiosyncrasies, and so on and so on. How far can they go by using only their own native culture to do that? Or do they also have to prove to the, to the rest of the world? Let, let's take a concrete example, music. Can, can they do it just by using their own native music or do they have to prove also that they are as well able to play the Ninth Symphony by Beethoven? You, you understand? Yeah, I, it's a really important question because in a way you're saying that can you use culture as the only instrument of projecting the image abroad without the economic power to some extent, right? Yes, and if you use the culture and you didn't have the chance before to export already right. certain manifestations like the musical, the Peking right, opera, right. Confucianism, Bollywood. Uh, you know, it's very interesting, the case of Mongolia. Uh, 
which I actually know something about because of the work we've done with Mongolia at the Asian Society, and that they actually thought about this a great deal. And there were three things that they've done, which in America, at least in major centers like New York and, and California, has made a difference. First was to use the idea of Mongolian power and Genghis Khan, that how actually Mongolia, this little place, was a big, powerful empire in the 13th century. And his, they commission history books by scholars, and all of this comes out. The second thing they did after they came out of the control of the Soviet Union was to actually begin to project this idea of democratic Mongolia and how it was going to affect. And then they started supporting the throat singers. And these throat singers became such a phenomenon that more people began to know about Mongolia because of throat singing. And that was precise, and it was supported by the government. So you had throat singers in major you know, centers all over. And so what they did was by creating a historical projection of a great place, and then music, and then the third thing was by promoting cultural tourism, that all of a sudden you at least had a little place, a little image of Mongolia that otherwise was non-existent. And I think that it is interesting, and they knew that they couldn't do it economically, they couldn't do it in any other way, so they had to use something else. And I think that in itself is rather interesting. I mean, similarly, Holland, in India especially, has done very interesting things with in terms of the culture by creating joint projects between Indian artists and Dutch artists. All of a sudden, Holland has a much bigger place at the Netherlands than you would imagine in, in a country like India. So what happens is that, in fact, the smaller countries often figure out that it is the cultural realm, it is the non-economic, non-military realm where they can actually have a chance to project themselves in a different way, uh, which is interesting. Whereas for big countries like China, they're really trying to see it as how does it play a part in their establishing themselves as a superpower, which is completely different. I, I quite like this, uh, the Mongolian question, and I see another layer behind that question. The question is, what does Mongolia have to do to be culturally interesting to us? And I mean, the soft power par excellence in the world is the United States, and they projected such a strong cultural image that the soft, soft power not only comes from their projection, but from the fact that everyone else is copying it now. So even if we look at China, we say China uh, is interesting in architecture because they won one of our Pritzker Prizes. We say China is interesting in literature because they've won one of our Nobel Prizes, not their own, but one of ours. And we say contemporary arts in China is interesting because it's exhibited here in museums and not in China. And some Chinese say uh, contemporary art in China is an invention by the West. So I don't think throat, throat singing will do. We once invited a throat singing group from Mongolia to a festival, and we did not invite them for their popular music and for their throat singing also, but because they also uh, turned it into a heavy metal act, adopting again something from the West, making <coughs> it understandable to us. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what does any country have to do to be actually able to compete with the soft power uh, we're exerting and mainly the US are exerting. So if I understand you correctly, part of it is to think about the role of the West in certain establishment of the soft power credentials, whether it's a Nobel Prize or um, other kinds of awards that we might give so that in a way it's the imprimatur of the West that still gives that credential. That's what you're getting at, right? And I think that 
because we are in this very transitional moment, I think that for the next 40, 50 years, it probably will be like that. Part of it is that the last 250 years, as I see it, has been part of the Euro-American access that is really where the power has resided. So the institutions that come out of the West are the ones that create that imprimatur. So in fact, we don't know 50 years from now, might there be some institutions that come out of China that might create a different kind of imprimatur. We don't have that yet. So I think that the unassailed cultural hegemony, if you will, that's a strong word, but cultural power of Euro-America, especially the United States too, continues to still play an important role. You know, it's very interesting. Recently, Chinese tried to create a Confucius Peace Prize with huge amount of money, as did Japan, if you remember the Imperiale, which is a big prize, or the Magsaysay Awards in the Philippines that actually were supported by the Rockefellers, the founders of the Asia Society. Um, and yet, the real, and Confucius Prize is a very interesting phenomenon. After establishing it, they canceled it. So in two years time, it doesn't exist anymore. Partly because again, the word Confucius was creating too much complication internally. But it also is because the Chinese realized that somehow they can't quite get there. So it was better not to put that kind of money in. Whereas the Imperiale, the big Japanese prize in the arts, continues to have some power, but unless they get a full page New York Times ad, nobody knows. That's not the same as Nobel Prize, right? So, you know, you do have this issue. But I do think that uh, we don't know 100 years from now how it will look like, or 50 years from now what it will look like, because the establishment of the big, big um, uh, credentialed institutions in the West is still very, very strong. And I think that only time will tell how that's going to change. Hard to figure that out right now. Um, I would like to ask a question about, uh, you use very often the dichotomy of cultural and economic. There's cultural power on the one hand and economic power on the other hand. But you also have um, a, a global discussion on creative economy where we don't see this as um, two poles but much more as a, a force field with different interesting positions. You mentioned also smart power by Hillary Clinton. Uh, doesn't think change a bit and it's not about uh, this strict separation between economic and, and cultural power and um yeah I, I i didn't mean to make it sound oppositional and i do agree that actually quite often the truth of the matter is that china and india we would not think of them as rising powers were it not for their economic growth that's the truth so then one might actually say that often the cultural piece of that power equation follows the economic positioning. Um, so I didn't mean to sound oppositional. However, I do feel personally that if everything gets reduced to the economic power, then in fact the ways that cultures can interact also gets secondarily reduced. So my only argument is that let us not assume that the economy can determine everything. So it's not oppositional, but it's really kind of giving a voice to importance of culture, which sometimes I feel in the globalization discussion gets reduced. And the word on creative economy and uh, Richard Florida argument, you know, uh, I'm actually, organizing a conference just a week from uh, next Monday in New York, which is to really look at the role of arts and culture in global cities beyond economic arguments. So I, for one, really feel it's important, those of us who are in that world of arts and culture, 
to really think about the role and importance of arts and culture that goes beyond the economic instrumentality. That creativity somehow matters, that's not just about the economics, but there is something else that we all know is important. What is it and how do we make a case for it? Why is it important for civilizations, for countries, for states to actually say arts matter in some ways, culture matters, and that's not just because it creates jobs. So I, for one, really try to push for that, uh, not to say that it's oppositional, but it needs to have that voice that comes outside of the economic arena to make a case in a larger global discussion. And there was a hand back there. Uh, uh, yeah. You have actually to, um, there was somebody ready before. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, but there was somebody ready. And then we have Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, this is a bit based on the first and second question, um, in a way, and it's got to do with uh, what is your view on Middle East, and in particular the GCC, which, um, yes, we know culturally and historically they don't have a lot to offer, or too much, but they are pushing a lot to get out there. So it's um, UAE. Yes. Yeah. Just the GCC in general, also, and, and the Middle East, of course. Well, I, I must say, you know, sitting next to Michael, who spent a lot of time in Dubai, he, I'm sure he has a lot to say about this, too. I just actually came back from Abu Dhabi, what, two weeks ago, um, because one of the things that, one of the hats I wear is as a special advisor at the Guggenheim and also for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Acquisition Committee. I think it is interesting how UAE, especially in, in the Gulf, but especially UAE, Abu Dhabi, Doha, really have decided that culture is the way they're going to punch above their weight, as it were, by using the money to attract major institutions and to create a kind of a cultural hub. Um, I am very ambivalent about this, I have to say. Um, on the one hand, and I can tell you uh, in terms of the Guggenheim project, that the Guggenheim has really changed its narrative uh, for Guggenheim Abu Dhabi to say, okay, how do we create a new narrative for many modernisms and contemporaneity so that the collection that they're building, or we are building, I suppose I'm just an advisor, but what they're building is to really strong Middle Eastern art, strong Chinese, strong Asian, strong Western, to create a new formation of a narrative in terms of modern and contemporary art starting from the 60s on. And I think if this comes to pass, the way we're building that collection, it will make a major contribution because none of the Western museums have ever done this before you know, whether it's a Museum of Modern Art at the Guggenheim or anywhere else, in terms of modern and contemporary art, the primacy of Western art has still been the way the narrative has been created. So you could say that that would be a major contribution as it comes to pass. That's very different from Doha um, in terms of how they're going about contemporary art manifestation, whether it's Jeff Koons or anybody else. So I think that there is some good that could come out of it. At the same time, the very problem to me of, of UAE is you're going to attract all the people from outside while you deal with the non-Emirati population pretty poorly within your own country. What does that say? And it's, it has other kind of dissonance the way I was describing in China too that you can think about this projection of the region out there, but you can't deal with all the issues that are within your country as well. So it creates some problems, but if in the process you create some interesting cultural narratives, and you know that's worth looking at too. So I'm kind of of two minds, I guess is what I'm saying. I would like to add on this uh, a little bit after my experience. 
because um, what we really have to look at is here the bigger picture of the Middle East. Um, if you look at um, the GCC countries being surrounded by countries like Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, it's actually a hell. Uh, in, in many ways, probably the most unstable uh, and uh, in terms of religion, fundamentalist uh, part of the world. So um, that w you can, of course, criticize many things in, in uh, the GCC countries in general. But however, I think it deserves a certain respect to at least try uh, to develop a, a, another idea of uh, what a Muslim society could look like. And I was really working uh, for several years in this country uh, representing uh, the Emirate of Dubai for culture and traveled a lot also uh, in many, actually in all Arabian countries at the time. And it was really remarkable to see how many uh, people from the Arab world really longed for having a similar type of society like there. This is even true to some extent to some Indians, although it's uh, the, the, the usual um, concept or stereotype is that the Indians are all uh, the, the, the slaves of, uh, of the Gulf, which is not entirely true, as we know. Especially and many, not Indians, but I mean, especially not Indians, Bangladeshis yeah, yeah. and others. Um, so I think um, it is a very particular concept, of course, not comparable to large countries like China and India, because there was no population so far. But it is certainly uh, a very specific type of urbanism um, which we should take uh, seriously because many of the people living in Dubai or in uh, Abu Dhabi and Doha today are nomads. They live for a certain period of time in this city and then they will go somewhere else. So they, they even don't have, they will never grow roots, they will never grow the same loyalty, they will never th think about n a nationalization, they don't want to become uh, an Emirati necessarily, but they want to be part of this for a certain period of time. And what we observe is that in our own cities, also in Zurich, there are a lot of people with the same uh, mindset, right? They come for a certain period of time here. They would never uh, expect to live here for all, uh, to, to become Swiss, to, to, to grow roots here, and so on and so far. So in other words, I think, uh, although it's a very extreme example, the GCC countries represent a very specific type of urban culture today, which is sort of spread all over the world. It's like a global nomadic culture is one of the necessary condition of a global culture. And that is what Pico Iyer used to call the global souls, you know, people whose sense of belonging is basically in the air. That it is not about belonging. Belonging is where you make home. Belonging is not about where you come from. And that is a condition in the extreme in the Gulf countries, especially in the UAE. Um, but to me, one of the things that, that's interesting is to use culture also as a way to mitigate against the kind of fundamentalist notions that they're surrounded by is something that's of a great deal of concern. But we mustn't forget at the same time that for many of the ruling elites, it's also a kind of a trophy wife syndrome you know, well, that's I, a, that's the same with uh, with, with the same with uh, the same with many philanthropists in the United States, and you know, the, uh, the whole cultural landscapes of our European cultures is actually made by principles who fought over su cultural supremacy 200, 300 years ago in a similar way, like we observed. Fair this enough. Today. Fair this, enough. This is it's just wherever the money is, you know, uh, whether it's is, the Rockefellers or you need, it's you need the UAE kind of injection in the beginning uh, to, sultans, to make right? It so there was somebody else yeah, asking sorry. a question. Yes, going back to the subject matter, I've got two specific questions. We have the, in Bombay, we already know the U.S. Information Service, British Council, Goethe Institute, and so on. So why not India, since we are there more than 60 years independent, deciding our own fate, why India has not brought out something like a Gandhi Institute propagating the culture of India. That's number one. And number two, do you see some sort of a cultural competitiveness? Does China perceive any alternative or any competitor as far as culture is concerned? We, we have already given up anything dealing with the, with the economics and, and military power and so on, but at least as far as culture is concerned, do you see some 
competition in, let's say, near future 10 or 15 years? Thank you. I, I, let me start from your last observation because I think it's very pertinent. In fact, in one of my recent visits to China, and I was talking to some intellectuals, and I said, where do you think China worries vis-a-vis -vis India? And this was in three different conversations. And invariably, the answer was this, which is, economically, we don't worry at all. There's no competition. I mean, he said, we come to India, we look at what you guys are doing, and you don't even have the proper roads. I forget it. Literally, it's like there is no competition. The place they said they worry about India is in cultural realm. He said, the strength of India and its culture, we, given our history of the last century, whether we could ever compete in the global arena in cultural terms to win the hearts and mind of people, that's where we worry about the most. In India, when you talk to decision makers and intellectuals, people don't even think about that. That's where I feel that India falls short. So I did actually a piece called Why is there no India Pavilion at the Venice Biennale? Not that Venice Biennale is the end all and be all, but not to be present at all when this many millions of people come to look at cultural practice, it's like ridiculous that Indian government doesn't even think it's in fact in their interest to put some money in it, along with some private sector or whatever you have. So I think that it's almost like the Chinese understand the strength that India has. Indians don't understand the strength they have to actually figure out how to project it better. And going back to your question of centers, clearly there is an Nehru Center in London. There has been a very strong interest in creating an India Center in Washington. Um, for the last 25 years, they've been looking at properties and they can't ever figure out how to buy it. So typical Indian government, you know, bureaucracy is the biggest hindrance that India has. But on the other hand, the other thing that Indian government does very poorly, and I have to say this, having worked on these projects for more than 30 years, is that if I want to work with the Indian government to create a major exhibition, no country makes it more difficult than the Indian bureaucracy. None. Even Indonesia is better than India. And this is ridiculous, where you don't even make it easy for people to have a cultural exchange. On the other hand, if Indian government is involved, you know, I, I, literally there's legends of how impossible it is. Chinese are easier. As long as it's not anything controversial, no problem. You know, they have a system, you figure it out, you make it happen. So I think that it's not taking seriously the strength that the country has to use it as part of the strategy in some way and get the bureaucratic hurdles out of the way. Would you say partly that this is because of the uh, system, the democracy which India has and the other side of the democracy which China is practicing? You know, Every time when people use the democratic argument in India, I always say that is an excuse for dysfunctionality. There is something called a democratic process, and there is something called bureaucratic hurdles, and they're not the same. <laughs> but very close to each other. Right. <laughs> Maybe, because it's an, ex uh, an experience of other countries too, of course. There was somebody uh, asking a question. Thank you for this uh, deep uh, analysis. Uh, I, I'm anxious to learn a little bit about the predominance of then the future language. I mean, you did not touch the uh, you did not touch the point that language is uh, very closely uh, related to our mindset uh, and to the use of technology. And so, both India and and China, for example, have comple completely adopted uh, 
the Western idea of uh, flying to the moon and getting something on the Mars. Uh, uh, although very many, very many uh, 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 scientists say that this is completely rubbish and spoil of money. Uh, so, uh, and then, and then, how this relates uh, to the to the traditional sciences, uh, theoretical physics, for example, where you have a Newtonian world and Einsteinian world, yeah. uh, and what does the language play in the role? Of um, the role of science. I, I mean. I I think that one of the ways I think about it, and other people might have other suggestions too, is that to some extent, the paradigm of what it means to be a successful nation for both China and India is a complete adaptation and adoption of the Western notion of a modernizing nation. What is progress? Science is a very important part of it. So all of these, to me, are part of the Enlightenment projects that really came about in the 19th century in the West. So science, rational thinking, modernization, technology, very, very important part of what it means to be a modern nation. In India, the notion of space and space and science and technology, ISRO as it was called, was in fact part and parcel of early modernization efforts by Nehru. So ISRO was developed in the early 50s, very early on. And in China, some of this has really begun to be very strong force post-cultural revolution. Um, so to some extent, I think both countries suffer from paucity of a new paradigm to think about what does it mean to be a modern nation that might not look like what the Western modern nation looks like. There's no discussion of what it looks like, except in China, they would say, yes, 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 but we are about the harmonious nation. And that is it's sort of the Asian value debate, which is basically to justify certain kind of totalitarian beliefs. In India, there's hardly any discussion of what is the alternative model of a new 21st century nation that might not look exactly like the late capitalist enlightenment model that has come out of the Euro-American uh, power base. So I think that that's part of it. On the other hand, I'm not arguing that you go back to some nostalgic romantic notion of the past. So I'm not saying that you, know, you don't do anything in terms of the modernization. But what else could it be that's a combination of something different is what I call 3.0 model of 21st century nation. But that discussion is not happening very much mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, just to end with a wonderful story, talk about space, is when uh, US put the man on the moon in the 60s, as it must be 66, no, 68, I think. 68, um, 68 right? 69. Yeah, 68. yeah. anyway, um, my former husband, who was a Peace Corps worker, was in a village in India. And he was absolutely focused on listening to the radio about when that first step would occur on the moon. And all the villagers were standing around him, sitting around him, and they, they said, what are, you, what are you so focused on? Why are you so obsessed? What's going on? And he said, oh, can you imagine the first man to land on the moon? This is the most important thing. The world has never seen this. And these two villagers were sitting next to him, and they said, why are you so excited? Rama went to the moon long ago. You know, This is already part of our story. That's no big deal. It's, we know it's possible because our God already did it. So the imagination that space is something to conquer was simply not part of the reality of that person. So I just thought you should think about that too, right? <laughs> uh, I think we should uh, wrap it up. Um, I would like to make uh, one comment on, on what you said last about um, the uh, maybe uh, lack of alternativities alternatives um, 
in terms of um, social development. I do think uh, also, uh, traveling a lot in, in particular in Asia, that there's still um, a very strong longing for most of the people to rather live in conditions like we used to live here in Europe or in the United States. So in one or the other way, uh, they rather think about uh, creating a society similar to ours. So that's, and I think this is something we should not forget that uh, the, probably uh, the overwhelming majority of the, uh, the, the population on the planet still rather considers us being sort of the best uh, society possible. And therefore, um, not push necessarily their societies for uh, dramatic changes. The second thing is, I agree to some and extent then with you. And if you think about this, just think about the environmental implications of that. For example, yeah. But there are many, yes. But the I mean, I'm not well. that, of course, I would be the first to say that the minute when Europeans and Americans say to China and India, well, you know, you have to control your environmental damage, I agree with Indians and Chinese that you did it mm -hmm. over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And now you tell us that mm -hmm. we can't have it? Mm -hmm. But that's not a good enough answer. You, if you talk about science and technology and innovation, let's really think about a new way of environmentally sound policies. No, but we are working on this. And what I want to say is that, um, first of all, th this is one point. The, the second point, you, you, um, you, you, you put an emphasis on, uh, emphasis on, on the uh, Euro-American uh, ax axis, and I agree with you. But on the other hand, there was a long period of um, a completely different political constellation. We today forget very often. Uh, there was uh, a second, you could call it empire, uh, since uh, 1917, to some extent really seriously changing the West, uh, and in particular also the United States, over quite uh, some time. And you can say that this was really the attempt to creating a kind of social alternative to uh, the capitalism. And I, I do think the threatening example of the decline and decay and disruption of the Soviet Union and the uh, communist world system is to some extent another reason why um, other societies today are not so keen to experiment with themselves again. Because in one or the other way, including India, they made their experiences with trying out. However, I think there was no uh, uh, society or no country in the world being so deeply involved in this kind of change like China. And maybe this is the reason why China has to come up with, a pro with another uh, kind of social model. Um, they like it or not, because they cannot go back to what they were 100 years ago. And they don't have this kind of organic development in politics, neither in, in education, neither in culture. They, for example, uh, managed to keep in India or in other countries being colonial, uh, colonialized. So uh, I would say China is really somehow forced to embrace a new model. And this is one of the reasons why the government also is so extremely keen uh, to think about uh, their, let's say, social and cultural uh, concept and have created so many think tanks. So that I think this is, uh, is really, um, they, they, maybe they even don't want, but they need to. They are really forced to, to uh, come up with a new model for their own society. Well, this, is my, this is my assumption. Yeah, I mean, I think that what sometimes about three, four years ago, uh, the term Beijing consensus was developed. And that idea of Beijing consensus was top-down, controlled model, but getting economically open, but politically constrained. And India and some Indian leaders are now talking about the Indian model, which is the inclusive growth model, which of course comes much more out of the Congress party, which is to say certain amount of entitlement for this inclusive growth, but that therefore it's not at the expense of just free economy for its own sake, but this kind of an inclusive idea. The truth is that both of those models are needed for different reasons ultimately because the American system, which some people would have said is a kind of unfettered capitalism, even though there too the limits of that were very, very evident in 2008. So the truth is around the world we all have to look for some new kind of models and that's where I feel that India and China 
should be thinking about what is that new model? How can you come up with something that goes beyond late capitalist model? And that would be an interesting conversation to have. Okay, I think um, for today we close the conversation. Thank you very much for being here for uh, this thought-provoking uh, conversation we had together with you. And maybe there will be a possibility to continue at some point, even here. Thank you very much for coming, and I really enjoyed being here. Thank you. Thank you.